Hello everyone, thanks uh, very much for tuning in. Today I'll be speaking to writer and activist Tariq Ali. Um, Tariq has a long history of socialist activism, writing and journalism, including with the Stop the War Coalition and uh, with this role in the New Left Review. So Tariq, thanks very much for coming on today. Okay. Um, so today we'll be speaking about your new book, Winston Churchill, His Times, His Crimes, uh, published by Verso. And basically in this work, you try to kind of uh, grapple with what you describe as being the cult of Churchill and kind of put a, an alternative perspective on the prime minister. Mm -hmm. so could you just kind of start to off by talking more yeah. about why, you think the <clears throat> why I wrote the book? Yeah, yes. um, it's uh, very straightforward that <clears throat> over the last few years in particular, the British state has been used, using Churchill to justify almost every war uh, they've been involved with. They do it in two ways, either by doing it directly, as they're doing at the moment, with Zelensky no doubt well tutored uh, to uh, sort of modestly uh, refer to himself as the Churchill of the present time and uh, his fan club uh, doing the same, which is pretty grotesque. But leaving that aside, there's a mood in Britain at the moment, which is quite right-wing, I think, uh, in intellectual circles and the academy, so that any frontal assault on Churchill, which were assaults that were pretty common in the 60s and 70s, are now regarded as lace majesty. No, we can't say that. And all this came to an, a head with the Extinction Rebellion people attacking racism, with the decolonizers demanding that the statues of uh, slaveholders and slave owners be destroyed in taking initiatives. And the Churchill statue was daubed with paint. Nobody, to my knowledge, has ever demanded it be torn down. But it is often daubed with paint, uh, and for good reasons, in my opinion. Um, it's a very tiny punishment for what was done. And so I thought, what is it about Churchill that they don't like young people? especially the activists. And after talking to many of them, I, I found out in a perfectly innocent way that not many had an idea of what Churchill did, apart from, you know, a general view of the empire. So I thought the best way to deal with this was to explain two things. One, what the British Empire was. So the book is not a traditional biography of Churchill. There are plenty of those around, some good, some awful. And I thought the best way to do it was to give an account of both the times and Churchill's policies in different uh, parts of the 20th century. And I did that quite, uh, you know, carefully documenting the research and the, the picture that emerges, as I knew full well, is uh, one of an imperial warlord. And the right-wing historians have been criticizing me. They do it because they support both the British Empire and Churchill. You can't just support Churchill. If you support him, you know, even for the limited period of the Second World War, it's uh, not enough, they think. You have to support the whole experience of empire. So they refer to the British Empire as actually a very civilized uh, uh, experience and uh, noblesse oblige. We treated the natives very well. And the fact that in 2022, there are serious historians lauded by the mainstream media who can say this sort of stuff, I do find quite shocking. Uh, the assault on these historians has come both from Britain, but largely from American academics. I mean, Caroline Elkins, for instance, spent 10 years researching 
the atrocities in Kenya, which he, and the camps the British set up in Kenya, which he calls the gulags of the uh, Western empires, and in this case of uh, uh, Britain. She is rubbish regularly. Oh, she doesn't know this, she doesn't know that. But she has pointed out that some of the most important papers connected with the what they did in Kenya have been destroyed. So who has the evidence? You know, she has uh, amassed an amazing indictment. Likewise, the famine in Bengal, which took at least three million, if not five to six million lives during the Second World War. The right wing historians say, oh, but that wasn't Churchill's fault. This was wartime, but I'm sorry. If you look at the correspondence between Field Marshal Wavell, who was the Viceroy, British Viceroy in India, and Churchill, it's sulfurous with Wavell sharply criticizing British government policy. And uh, Churchill saying, well, we need the, uh, we need the rice uh, to feed our sturdy lads in Greece fighting the fascists. But actually, Britain later, fed some of the sturdy lads, not the others, and uh, launched a huge offensive against the Greek resistance. And Churchill ordered General Scobie, who had taken Athens, if there's any resistance, treat Athens like a colonial city. So what I've done in, uh, in my book is link imperial politics together, not just see it as one incident, then another, but see how these incidents uh, uh, were linked and do reply. And of course, you know, the right uh, right wing historians uh, have gone a bit bananas, I mean, uh, and denounced the book in a stupid way. But um, they should calm down, actually, because in fact, their attacks are helping sales, which from, you know, one point of view is quite positive. People are so taken aback by their intemperate attacks that they say, we better go and read this book. And that is really happening. I, you know, got a thousand Facebook messages, uh, more or less, over the last week uh, along these lines, uh, including many, many other things. So that was Churchill abroad. Churchill at home <clears throat> was equally vicious against the organized working class movement. You know, whether it was the Welsh miners or the, um, the workers in uh, railway dock workers in Glasgow or the general strike in uh, Britain in 1926 where miners were really fighting for a starvation wage. What their demands were for a not a wonderfully, you know, healthy high wage, they were demanding slightly better conditions which is why the attempt by the government and the mine owners to crush them triggered off this general strike, which the TUC didn't fight. I mean, Churchill's remark at the time, which I forgot to put on the book, but someone from the, uh, whose great grandfather was involved in the general strike just wrote to me and said, my grandfather used to say that what Churchill said, which really anchored them, that these miners who've gone on strike have empty heads. Let's give them empty stomachs to bring them to their senses. Starve them out. And that was uh, the policy of the mine owners backed by the British government. So, you know, this is a history you can't forget. And so this glamorization of Churchill, 2000 books, movies galore, non-stop uh, television serials. <clears throat> this is a relatively modern phenomenon. It happened uh, after the Falklands War waged by Mrs. Thatcher in 1982, a 12-day war, where she started using Churchill. Then she used Churchill in a trip to the United States to justify nuclear weapons and deterrence via nuclear weapons. Uh, then Tony Blair took up the cult of Churchill in uh, fighting first the war in Kosovo, then the, uh, and Yugoslavia. That was the NATO's first war to enlarge NATO. Uh, and then later in Iraq and um, Africa and elsewhere in the world. So uh, 
the contrast with the 60s and 70s couldn't be greater. I mean, in the 70s, you had a radicalizing culture where you saw great anti-war movies and plays on the stage. Howard Brenton, an old uh, colleague and friend, wrote the Churchill play, which started off uh, with the uh, soldiers carrying Churchill's coffin, suddenly hear rumblings in the catafalque, and the soldiers say, oh my God, he's still alive. He won't die this one. <laughs> and, you know, that was the attitude. This has now changed, and Churchill is an icon, a saint, a household god. So my book had this very simple name of saying, hey, hang on, this is getting overblown. This narrative that is coming from politicians and uh, Churchill worshipping historians is wrong, at least in my opinion it is. You can carry on writing, but don't try and stop us from writing. And that is the most dangerous aspect of this, that all debates now are considered suspect. I mean, the Churchill College, which has, you know, uh, interestingly enough, had uh, developed a race and empire project to discuss these sides of Churchill, that has been stopped and cancelled because Bengali historians uh, and a professor at Churchill College, Priya Gopal, uh, attacked what had taken place. So in this situation, you can't stay still. You know, if you have any sort of intellect left, uh, you have to take some of these uh, things on. And my book is written largely uh, not for a narrow circle of people, but for young people in particular, who don't really know what Churchill did and what he was and are bewildered by uh, quite a lot of what is going on. And I hope, you know, many others will read it too, but primarily it is written for uh, young people who are interested in politics and history, though everything in the culture is designed to try and stop them doing it. And um, someone commented uh, in a in a conservative paper on Sunday, two days ago, that um, Tariq Ali is murdering history. Well, excuse me. The people who are murdering history is the people who want to keep these crimes of the British Empire covered up. That's not me. And you'd have thought that with the end of the old British Empire, they'd calm down. But they can't because they've now got entrapped uh, in NATO under the command of the United States to fight more wars. So every war they fight, they need Churchill and they use him in this particular fashion. So a huge cult of Churchill has developed and that cult has to be challenged and brought down really. Yeah. I was thinking you mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier and you talk about a lot in the book kind of how Churchill first of all kind of saw himself as advancing forces first of all reports of the interests, and then second of all as a servant of the empire and he was very very fundamentally attached to the idea of the empire and to British imperialism globally um, I was just wondering if you could kind of delve in a little bit more into how this kind of ideology and worldview that Churchill had shaped his political career um, and particularly as well how it kind of shaped his actions during World War II. Yeah, I mean look the, the fact is uh, whether we like it or not that the growth and development of mercantile capitalism led if you had a strong navy led to empire building because in order to defend your trade and trading posts and bring loot back from other parts of the world safely, you needed a large navy. And so the British Empire was born well before the Industrial Revolution. You know, it was the early 19th and the late 18th centuries which saw the rise of the British Empire. After all, the United States, what is now the United States, had been taken over uh, and conquered in the 
17th century. And then in the 18th century, Britain lost that empire to indigenous uh, white colonists who had been colonists, but who developed contradictions with uh, London and fought London off to get their independence by violence. I mean, the founding fathers of the United States, all of whom were, by the way, slaveholders, nonetheless, they had no compunction about using force to drive the British out. So the first big rebellion against the British was by white settlers uh, who had really settled uh, in the uh, United States. <clears throat> and the defeat in the United States sent the British warships uh, and traitors to other parts of the world. Uh, so the entry, let's say, of the British in India in 1750s uh, followed or preceded, just preceded the defeat in the United States. So instead of the United States, by a series of concerted measures, both economic and military and political, they took India. India was in a state of collapse itself. The Mughal Empire was in a bad way. <clears throat> and from 1757 to 1857, the British were trying to keep a stranglehold on India. In 1857, there was a huge uprising in India, the Great Uprising, which united Muslim, Hindu, Sikh ruling classes, and the population from below. It was a popular uprising. The British held on, but it was touch and go at one point whether they would succeed. Ultimately, they succeeded because uh, they had the Maxim gun, so to speak, and the Indian uh, forces uh, uh, didn't. So after 1857, the British Empire became incredibly violent. It was before too, but after 1857, it imposed a rigorous apartheid, racial apartheid, political apartheid, punished the groups that they believed had sparked off the uprising. I mean, during the uprising, the areas in Delhi inhabited by Muslim intellectuals and poets and bohemians were just burnt down as a punishment. So <clears throat> that's how the British uh, empire developed. And you know, where empires developed and occupations take place, you have resistance. And when the resistance starts in one way or the other, and measures are taken against it, it sparks off new forms of resistance. And that is what the British had to confront in India and in, uh, and in Africa uh, for some time. Now, <clears throat> the Second World War brought matters to a head. A, because the British were very dependent on colonial troops from Africa and mainly from India. I mean, tens of thousands of Indian natives, uh, soldiers died, both in the, more in the Second World War, but some even in the First World War, quite a lot of casualties during the First World War. So the conquest of colonies served these, these purposes that they enabled Britain to conquer more parts of the world. I mean, there were Indian soldiers involved, for instance, in the Opium Wars in China, were involved in the siege of uh, uh, Beijing and other uh, uh, Chinese cities. So colonialism bred a use of native peoples as mercenaries and created colonial style armies in these countries. And by the time the Second World War took place, there was a combination of two things going on. Let's take India as the example. One was uh, a political resistance led by Gandhi and Nehru and others uh, who finally who challenged the British for taking India into war without consulting them. 
the more radical wing of the nationalist movement led by Subhas Chandra Bose actually organized the Indian National Army, collaborated with Germany and uh, Japan to release Indian prisoners of war. The Japanese did it. And this Indian National Army, as was done by many people who had illusions about Japan because they were an Asian power and thought, and the Japanese used that, they're saying, we're an Asian power, we're Asians like you, let's go and destroy the British Empire. It was quite a popular slogan, till people saw what the Japanese themselves were capable of doing. But in any case, the British were challenged by British soldier, British Indian soldiers organized into an Indian National Army. An episode that has been underplayed a great deal, both by the left and also by the right, but was nonetheless important. Uh, so India was in a state of turmoil, turmoil throughout the Second World War. In 1942, height of the war, Gandhi launched the Quit India movement, saying the British should get out of India. Hundreds and thousands of people were picked up, arrested, including the leadership of the Congress, etc., etc. But within the war itself, you know, let's get some things straight. And this is what I think the, in particular, irritates right-wing conservative historians, which is that I don't deny that at a time when Britain was threatened and realized it was being seriously threatened by the Third Reich and Nazi Germany, Hitler was the only Tory, well, not the only one, but the main Tory who decided that the Germans had to be fought, not because they were fascists, not because they had these anti-Jewish laws. And I think it's important to say that throughout the war, not a single allied leaders referred to what was being done to the Jews of Europe. I have yet to find it. A major speech by any European leader saying the Jews are being crushed. Requests from the Jewish agency to bomb the concentration camps, ignored not our priority. We don't have planes. And so now they claim that they were the ones responsible. And uh, Blair, I think, on one occasion said, you know, uh, we had to fight a war against the Germans to save the Jews, to which the reply is, A, that war was not fought on that basis. And secondly, if that was your purpose, you lost because six million Jews were killed. So you suffered a huge defeat. Uh, <clears throat> And, uh, you know, the, the, so the role of Britain, you know, they were handcuffed by the class system. Uh, the officer corps of the British Army, largely led by upper and upper middle class officers from military families, the army had been reformed after the disbanding of the new model army created by Cromwell and Fairfax. And so it was very deliberately and brutally a class army in the real meaning of the word, in the sense that its officer class was very dominant. And I think we have to remember that. And this officer corps proved incapable of taking decisions and fighting when they should have, not all of them, but some of them. Uh, the, the fall of Singapore in 1942, a citadel which Churchill said could never be taken by anyone. Uh, the Japanese took it with an army less than, you know, the British army was three times the size of the Japanese but they couldn't contain Singapore. So the fall of Singapore, the defeat in Tobruk, the Rommel's march on Egypt, uh, there, were, there were serious discussions that Churchill should be dumped and a new prime minister elected. And Nye Bevan, the Labour leader, said that the, that the class structure of the officer corps of the British Army was beyond a joke now. And he said if Field Marshal Rommel had been, unfortunately for him, if had he been born in Britain, he wouldn't have risen above the rank of a sergeant. And Bevan pointed to all the British officers in the uh, international brigades of the civil war in Spain, 
who had fought and said one of them defeated, inflicted the most impressive defeats on the Franco-fascists as he took his people across the Ebro. And this guy is working as a sergeant in some, you know, hidden unit in Britain, not even sent to, but why aren't these people being used? These are questions that conservative historians refused to even consider. And all these are discussed in some detail in my book, which is why I stress the book isn't just about Churchill, it's about the system that created him. This was the world he grew up in. Uh, he himself came from a you know, military family. Uh, uh, they had a dukedom and they had Blenheim Palace given to them by the state. And uh, Churchill and his father were the only serious politicians. They, otherwise, they did nothing. The Randolph and Winston Churchill were the only serious politicians they produced. You know, both quite interesting figures, but produced in this milieu. And I haven't sort of really talked about Ireland, but in Ireland, Churchill was the creator of the black and tans, which were a combination of uh, criminals released from prisons, you know, not political criminals, so to speak, but ordinary criminals released from many in Irish prison to go and uh, wear the new uniforms and kill the enemies of the British Empire, which meant mainly Irish nationalism. Uh, and some of the atrocities committed by the Black and Tans in Ireland, then led to a mutiny in India. Now, this is a mutiny among Irish soldiers, the Connaught Regiment, one of the most revered regiments in military history. The soldiers um, and sergeant level officers basically mutinied. Uh, uh, because of what had happened in Ireland, they were getting letters home about the black and tans. And when the British said to them, we leave you alone and the Indians will come and kill you, they said, we'd rather be killed by the Indians than by you lot. That radicalization uh, revealed a level of internationalism, which was beginning to uh, make the rounds in different parts of the globe. So. That's the history I talk about, and that's the history I find interesting. The right-wing historians who basically have been going on about there's so many mistakes, most of these are not mistakes. They're differences of fact and interpretation. Uh, you know, when uh, this, uh, I called, referred to him as perhaps a bit harshly as the chairman of the Churchill Arslikan Society, Andrew Roberts. I mean, when he says that Churchill wasn't defeated after the Second World War, I mean, you have to say, what fantasies are you trying to live in and create? Churchill wasn't particularly popular inside the army amongst the soldiery during the Second World War. The propaganda didn't always work. Otherwise, you can't explain the defeat. When there was an officers and soldiers parliament in Cairo in 1944, and they had elections, I mean, mock elections, Labour swept the board with the Tories coming last. Above them were two parties, the Liberals and the Commonwealth Party, which was a, a left radical party. So there was no big surprise. Uh, I remember many years ago, about nearly 50 or nearly 50 years ago, I was in Phnom Penh in Cambodia with uh, a Scottish trade union miners leader, Lawrence Daly, a great guy, uh, autodidact, very, very intelligent. And we, it was the height of the Vietnam War. We were on our way to Vietnam for the war crimes tribunal. And uh, I said, Lawrence, I've never totally understood one thing, which is that Churchill, the great war hero, was basically trounced in the 1945 elections. And he said he was, I mean, Lawrence said he was quite hated by large sections of the population because of his role in the strikes 
uh, in uh, Wales and Scotland and uh, the whole country during the general strike. But underlying that was a deeper hatred. As a result of Tory governments in the past, the country was neck deep in shit. And we thought if we elected Churchill, he'd order us to do press ups. So, you know, that was the attitude. Many, many other people, when I first came to Britain in 1963, in the fall of 1963, I was really quite amazed at the number of people, uh, especially from working class backgrounds, students with me, or, you know, comrades of one sort or another, who described family hatreds for Churchill. And emails I'm getting now as a result of this right-wing attack, and lots of them are going on about that. In my family, we hated Churchill. Some even say we belong, we were Tories, but we belong to an anti-Churchill Tory tradition. So it's obvious that the book has, uh, you know, brought brought on a, a counterattack, and that counterattack is now creating debates, which was my intention in the first place, because I, I explain in the preface and the introduction that these uh, debates are absolutely necessary, and trying to seal them off with a, a wave of uh, sort of euphemisms and flattery and covering up stuff isn't going to work. So, you know, the uh, history works in strange ways. It allows a period of uh, idolatry uh, to take place, but then sooner or later it turns to iconoclasm and breaking down the icons. And I, this second phase is long overdue, and I hope that, you know, my book in some ways will start it off. So one of the things I think is really interesting about your book, particularly why it's so important today, is obviously now the cult of Churchill and the mythology around World War II playing such a big role in justifying the kind of Western response to, to the war in Ukraine and yeah. to the increase in militarism and kind of warmongering on the part of Western leaders. Um, on the other hand, what you talk about, which I always find to be some of the most interesting parts of the book, is the way that ordinary people in the empire, throughout the empire, and at home in Britain, kind of organized this kind of resistance towards Churchill and kind of formed these kinds of ties of international solidarity. And I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about like how, what this history can kind of tell us about fine imperialism today in the context of the war in Ukraine. Two things. One point I didn't mention, which I should, that love of empire and pride in empire went very deep in the British people. There's no way around it. And when I say the British people, I don't just mean the Conservative Party and its supporters. They had lots of working class supporters too, by the way, as they do now in the North. But it was on a much huger level. One of the tragedies of of British history and British politics is that the Labour movement and the Labour Party were totally caught up in imperialism. Um, Attlee, imperialist at the core. I mean, let me tell you one thing, because we we're all very worked up about the Windrush <coughs> um, people and what happened to them now under Preeti Patel. When the Windrush was on its way from the Caribbean to Britain, Attlee as Prime Minister raised the question, uh, saying there are too many migrants here, too many, there were hardly any, but Attlee as British Prime Minister said, is there no way we can divert the ship to East Africa? This is your, you know, much loved uh, British Prime Minister worship now because of the health service. Uh, but on foreign policy, the Labour has always been pretty appalling. Throughout the empire, they were imperialists. Each and every single Labour government backed the empire. 
at a time after the Second World War, when they could have decolonized Africa, they didn't. One reason these atrocities took place in Kenya and uh, accelerated after the emergency in 1956 was because labor had not decolonized Africa. Just like the French Socialist Party was waging war in Algeria and were actually viciously uh, attacking the Algerian National Liberation Front. A lot of the Labour cabinet ministers in the Wilson government were attacking Indonesia, defending the most retrograded forces in Malaysia, uh, which they'd done even in the 50s. I mean, there's a photograph of British members of parliament, Labour members, standing in Malaya during, while they were trying to crush a, a left-wing insurgency, mainly led by the Chinese population. And just below them, in this group photograph, are the heads of decapitated guerrilla fighters. So it's extremely important to understand that the appalling policies of Starmer and Blair and, you know, with the tiny period when we had Corbyn, are normal. These are normal labor policies. These are not new. They were not invented by Blair, leave alone Starmer, uh, who's incapable of uh, thinking uh, f uh, freshly about anything. So, it, so you have to understand that imperialism went very deep. There were brave and courageous minorities who attacked the empire from the 19th century onwards, you know. But by and large, the British working class took to the idea of empire. They were proud of it. And this is one reason why it's been difficult to get it out of them. I mean, we, it did begin to happen when leaders like uh, Scargill and uh, Scanlon, um, Hugh Scanlon and Jack Jones emerged. They had some background in progressive movements. I mean, Jack Jones had fought in Spain. Scargill was effectively a communist. So they had some tradition, but the old trade union leaders throughout the period of empire supported either Labour or, as it was, largely Tory and uh, coalition governments. So using it to justify... Uh, Ukraine, uh, like they justified the Falklands War and using Churchill, it isn't a big surprise. And uh, Zelensky uses Churchill foolishly, actually, because and the, the reason the Germans didn't land on the beaches of England was because of two things. One, the Red Army of the Soviet Union had broken the backbone of the Third Reich at Stalingrad in Kursk. That effectively made it clear to the German population as well that they were going to lose this war. And they were aided and helped by the American uh, war industry. So it was America, the American industry uh, and weaponry and Russian heroism and their own weaponry and their sacrifices that won the war so that British beaches remained safe. And this uh, Zelensky doesn't understand, though he should know, that large numbers of Ukrainians fought inside the Red Army against the Third Reich, and the number of um, Ukrainians whose heirs Zelensky is allied with, who fought with Hitler and deserted to Hitler, were relatively small compared to those who fought with the Red Army. That's one point. The other point is that, ironically, uh, some, you know, it never fails the ironies of the present situation. The Ukrainians and NATO are using Churchill, but in fact, the person Putin worships today as an ultranationalist himself, is General uh, Denikin, who was a Civil War general in the White Army fighting the Bolsheviks, uh, and uh, effective, but defeated finally by 
uh, Lenin and Trotsky uh, and the you know politics of the Bolsheviks who won that war against odds. Uh, Putin worships Denikin because he hates the Bolsheviks, and Denikin was Churchill's favorite general as well. And Churchill armed him, wanted him to be the central figure in getting the throne back for the Romanov dynasty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's an irony which escapes the current Ukrainian uh, nationalist and and fascists who surround Zelensky and are part and parcel now of this government, which exists thanks to NATO. I mean, uh, so the uses of Churchill will continue as long as wars are fought. Thanks, Tarek. And is there anything else you want to say? I think we've yeah. covered quite a lot. Great, amazing. Yeah, what are you going to do with this? Are you going to uh, put it out as a... All right, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks very much for that interview, Tarek, and thanks a lot for coming on. Um, for everyone watching, if you're interested in this uh, in this interview and you'd like to learn more, please buy Tarek's book, Winston Churchill, His Times, His Crimes, uh, where Tarek goes into a lot more detail about all these very interesting and very important facts. Um, and as well, if you are interested in all this politics, you should consider joining Counterfire. We um, are central to shaping and building movements against imperialism, against war, against racism, and against economic uh, oppression in Britain and abroad. And um, yeah, if you're committed to fighting with us, please consider joining Counterfire. So, Tech, thanks very much. Thanks, Queen. Okay, man. Bye.